Well, good morning. And welcome to our collective community of faculty, of staff, students, alumni, partners, and indeed all of our stakeholders as the citizens of the state of Nebraska, to the fabulous Lead Center for the Performing Arts here on our main campus in Lincoln this morning. And I know that there are many joining us across our web stream that's being live cast out across our statewide campus this morning. You know, we have this opportunity once a year to pause, to reflect, to look at the state of our university, of your university, and to collect ourselves and think about the future and think about the opportunities that we have lying ahead of us. This is kind of a particularly poignant state of the university address for a lot of reasons that you'll hear this morning. But none less than the fact that we actually sit this year on the eve, if you will, of the sesquicentennial, I knew I'd screw that word up, <laughs> anniversary celebration year of our great university that comes up for us next year in 2018-19. I tell you that it is indeed a real privilege and honor for me to serve as the 20th Chancellor of the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And I say that as an alumnus, I say that as a parent of four former and current Husker students, I say that as a spouse of a devoted, committed, and passionate alumna, and I say that as a, indeed being a citizen of the great state of Nebraska and a taxpayer here in this state. And each and every day I want you to know that I get up in the morning recognizing the challenge and the opportunity that we have every day in meeting our mission. And what an obligation and a responsibility that is for all of us as we move forward. Now I want to take you back, if you will, a year to when we were having this conversation last September. And we were talking about the great momentum that the university had been, has been experiencing for a number of years in our immediate past and that we're experiencing today. And we talked a lot about what the opportunities are ahead of us for growth, for growth and enrollment, for growth and student matriculation and success, for looking for innovative and new ways for fiscal management that will allow us to devote more and more of our resources to our core academic mission. And indeed, looking forward to how we can even grow further our academic distinction, not only in the Big Ten Academic Alliance, but nationally and internationally around the world. And you might also remember that we talked about maybe there are efforts and ways that we might be able to collaborate at a greater level with the NU system of institutions. And in particular, we pointed to and talked a little bit about our sister research campus at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Now, I have a lot to cover with you this morning. I'm going to forewarn you of that. But I want to kind of map out for you the road of our dialogue this morning. I want to first reaffirm for you the opportunity and the challenge of our mission in higher education, especially at this point in time. I want to talk to you about the amazing year that we've had this past year that you saw a little bit about in that introductory video a few moments ago. I want us to pause a little bit and reflect about the current time. This is a transformational and a turbulent time that we live in. And those externalities are ones that we should be paying attention to, both in our immediate and our long-term future. And then I want to talk about some bold transformations that are going to be required of us in the immediate year that we have ahead, this academic year, and certainly in the second year of our budget biennium that's coming up. And then I want to close the loop at the end by talking with you again about focusing on that mission and doubling down and focusing, if you will, on our land-grant university mission in higher education. You know, we have the awesome responsibility and remit of being this state's public, comprehensive, research-intensive university. We're the largest university of higher education in the state of Nebraska. We're the largest center for creation of research and discovery and creative activity here. 
were the home and Carnegie Doctoral Granting Institution for higher education here in our state. You all recognize that we cover a comprehensive set of disciplines here in areas of study, in research, in creative activity, and in discovery. And you also recognize that we were established and put here nearly 150 years ago under the Morrill Act of 1862, establishing us as the People's University of the state of Nebraska. With that tripartite mission of excellence in affordable and accessible and high quality education for our people. The secondary mission that we have in pushing the knowledge barriers forward with new knowledge and research and creative activity and discovery that matters, that matters to our people here in this part of the world. And then thirdly and importantly, that outreach and engagement mission that we have with our place, the engagement with the people of Nebraska, with the place of Nebraska, to improve human quality of life here and economic well-being across our state. Now, I would wager to you that in our 149-year history, that tripartite mission has probably never been more important. For the external world that we live in, for the place that we serve, our education has never been more needed for career and life success of our students nor has research and creative activity and discovery been more needed for improving human life and improving our natural conditions of our environment. And I would also wager to you that there have been few times in the last 15 decades that have required us to pay more attention to translating the value of higher education, to understanding the benefits for the general public of higher education, and of the academy that we exist in today. Now, you might remember that on this same stage in April at the investiture ceremony, I called it the Grand Poobah ceremony, I'm sorry, <laughs> but at the investiture ceremony, I talked about the history of our institution, and I referred to this advantage that we have geographically of being in the middle of everywhere and everything. And in fact, historically, and at the present time and long time into the future, that this institution serves as the DNA in so many ways of the state of Nebraska. I also talked about the fact that we're the flagship institution of the University of Nebraska. We talked about that last year, if you recall. And I want to point to a little different texture of this this morning in thinking about the connection of the university to the state. I've lived in five states during my life, and I can tell you that I have never been in a place that is as connected to its university on the basis of its people as Nebraska. And that is a virtue and a value that I don't think we can ever underestimate, that we should ever diminish, that we should seek to keep connected, that sense of connectedness of the state to its flagship land-grant university here. Now let's talk about the past year. We certainly recognize that we have the momentum of becoming a bigger institution. We talked a lot about that last September. That certainly has led to our enrollment growth that we have experienced the last several years. You'll recall that last year in the fall of 2016, we enrolled 25,897 students on our campus surpassing the previous all-time enrollment record in 1982 of 25,075 students. And this year, in no small feat of accomplishment, we topped that record again at 26,079 students enrolled and studying with us here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Now, I don't need to tell you that in a year like we have had, to see an enrollment increase is a major accomplishment. And we should feel very good about that. We should feel very good about what it says about our university and the trajectory and the quality that the university is on. If you look at that historical enrollment trend since back in this slide to 2002 over the last 15 years, you will see that today we enroll more students from Nebraska 
more students that are non-residents, domestic and international than ever before. We have the largest freshman class in the history of our institution at 4,905 students, the most diverse freshman class and student body at 15% that we have ever had, all the while maintaining the academic credential of our student body while we're growing. That is a phenomenal accomplishment for us. And as you will recall, we have talked about that enrollment growth moving us forward. I want to do just a quick shout out here before we talk a little bit about the future. That enrollment growth this year led by our College of Business, you see here in their new home in Hawks Hall on campus. 15% increase in the freshman class compared to a year ago in our College of Business. Aided by enrollment gains in the College of Arts and Sciences, the College of Engineering, the College of Architecture, the College of Fine and Performing Arts. Now you know that we have talked a lot about increasing our enrollment, and I wanted to speak to that briefly here to tell you the results of a task force that we put to work last year to look at our enrollment growth strategies. It was led by Amber Williams and Tiffany Hing Moss with a team of faculty and staff who worked with outside expert, expert consultation to analyze the competitive landscape, if you will, of higher ed. And I will tell you, it's never been more competitive than it is today. To look at institutions that have grown like we aspire to grow and what their experiences have been and to look specifically around planned growth or smart growth in areas that we think we need to grow rather than randomly or generically. And the result of that task force's effort, and I'll sum it up, it's very, I'm summing it up in a very aggregated way here, is a little different than I talked to you about a year ago. You might remember 35,000 was the number. And I said, that's an aspirational directional number. We'll see what our diligence tells us. What our diligence has told us that a very realistic goal for us by 2025 is to enroll 29 to 31,000 students on our campus. And that an aspirational and I believe achievable goal is 32,500 students in that time. And if you remember that graph that I just showed you, if you look back over the last five years, we have actually increased our enrollment by nearly 2,000 students on this campus. We kind of forget that in, uh, in thinking about what those opportunities that lie ahead of us are. I also referenced last year this number, and I know it's an audacious number, but I want to say to you today that we shouldn't view this as an unrealistic number. To say that we would like to see 80% of our students graduate in four years or aspire to that is not an unrealistic aspiration, but it's going to require a lot of work on the part of our campus and our culture. It's a national phenomena that we're dealing with, and I think we should pursue that at all haste. We had a second task force working last fall in this area of student success, led by Amy Goodburn and Kathy Ankerson and a team that looked at the ways that we continue to work in student support and services, recognizing that our student profile and demographic continues to change with more first-generation students than we've seen in recent years and certainly a more diverse demographic across the board, knowing that we need to invest in these areas moving ahead. We've had some success. You know, I was so pleased to stand in the Kimball Hall earlier this fall and meet over 200 new First Huskers enrolled in that first-gen program and the first-gen faculty program now that our student success team has implemented with over 300 of our faculty having affiliated with this group to mentor our first-gen students moving forward. I will tell you that I think we need to keep this relatively simple. Now, I kind of tend to be a simple common sense type of person. And we need to keep it simple and thinking about 15 times 2 times 4 equals 120. And we need to reemphasize and make a commitment in the way that we mentor and we advise our students within their own personal boundaries to meet that goal on their own as we move forward. Now, we've had a phenomenal year of infrastructure growth. And I'm not going to go through all of these individual pictures that you see on the slide. But this fall, 
We opened more newly renovated or new facilities or upgraded facilities and aesthetics of our campus than we can remember in recent history. Everything from the $84 million largest private funded building ever constructed on our campus in Hawks Hall's College of, the College of Business with Hawks Hall, to the North, Lab, North Love Adele Hall Learning Commons, to the Law Clinic and the College of Law, to new dormitory and residence and dining facilities, you see the, the impact that these will have for many years to come, including some aesthetic uh, additions to our campus and the beauty of our campus and the transportation around our campus for student services. We have a number of projects that are currently under construction and underway, which will add to that infrastructure as they come to completion in the next two years, including the new Student Health Center and Lincoln Division of the University of Nebraska Medical uh, Center on Antelope Valley, the completion of the new library repository addition, new energy facilities here for city campus and the thermal tank construction, and the first building of phase two now under construction at Nebraska Innovation Campus. We have a number of projects that are under planning and design that have now been approved by the Board of Regents to move forward in our infrastructure, anchored most heavily by the Mabel Lee Hall renovation project that we'll be, under, we'll be undertaking in the next couple of years and the gymnastics facility that is a result of that change in renovation. I want to draw your attention to, in this slide, the Memorial Mall Loop Road project, one that was just approved by the Board of Regents in their last meeting, that will beautify that existing iconic space on our main campus here between the stadium and the new business building, beginning immediately following the completion of our football season this year. We have two projects that are up for approval here in the next two weeks by our Board of Regents, including the new home for the Carson Center for Emerging Media Arts in the former Nebraska Bookstore facility not far from here, as well as a complete renovation of the Nebraska East Union to match the new residential facilities there on East Campus. And if that wasn't enough, we have a number of major projects that are in the initial planning stages, some that have funding associated with them already. And again, as I described Mabel Lee, I'll use this one to say anchored by the major renovation project in addition to our College of Engineering infrastructure that we hope to be deep into within the next couple of years. So huge opportunities for us in matching that growth with infrastructure and improved instructional and resource facilities for our campus. One of the things that we have to celebrate this year, you might remember last year we were talking about the upcoming site visit of the Higher Learning Commission's accreditation team for our 10-year accreditation of the university. Lori Bellows and Amy Goodburn and Renee Batman and a number of our faculty, about 300 of our faculty and staff, had worked hard for that visit. And I can tell you it was one of the best ones they said they've had. An absolute clean, pretty accreditation, if I would call it that, and result for us for the next 10 years. And they pointed to things like, I won't read these statements to you out of the report, but things like the self-reflective capacity of our university and strategy for looking forward and thinking about the strategic planning that we currently are underway and doing. The, the enhancement of our student support services and teaching and learning resources and infrastructure that I was just talking to you about in even greater levels since the information that they had for the site uh, visit. The fact that our faculty and students are focused on improving diversity and inclusion, that we'll come back and talk later this morning about our steps moving forward and the opportunity to be committed in new ways to that area for enhancement of our educational enterprise. And this last one is just a reaffirmation of what we said a few minutes ago, where they recognized, they felt it was palpable to them, the sense of commitment to Nebraska and Nebraska to us of the university here is the People's University of the state of Nebraska. 
Now, you saw the reel earlier, and I'm not going to be able to highlight everything that was in that reel, but I think it's important for us today, especially given some of the challenges that we have to confront in the coming year, to celebrate the accomplishments of this past year. It has been a phenomenal, momentous year for our campus. If you look across the academic colleges, things like our College of Law being for the second year in a row ranked as the number one best value law school in the country. Things like our College of Business continuing to accelerate and jump in rankings in the US News and World Report rankings of all business colleges and schools nationally now in the top 50. Things like for the first time, the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award, very prestigious award in this field, being given to a group of students and a student project in our College of Journalism and Mass Communication called The Wounds of White Clay. We should be proud of those accomplishments and so many others that have happened across our campus. A military and veteran success center, relatively new in our history, led by Darrell Everhart, now bringing us the ranking of 24th best in the country, best in vets designation. For now, nearly 800 students studying with us as undergraduates who are student veterans, almost 4% of our undergraduate population. Awards and recognitions for teaching and instruction and outreach that our faculty continue to receive nationally and internationally. And even locally here this past year, I would shout out to our Department of History in the College of Arts and Sciences, named as the University of Nebraska-wide Departmental Teaching Award winner this year. Or Professors Aaron Blankenship in Statistics, Jason Kautz in Chemistry, Eileen Hebbets in the School of Biological Sciences, for their teaching and outreach excellence in those same, the university-wide OTICA and IDEA awards. We also have this little thing called Silicon Prairie that you hear about. And it's real, folks. The new business development that is happening in our environment here and the opportunities for that, I want to point out that this university fuels that. This university is the fuel for that entrepreneurism. And this year, the university system-wide awards again, the Peter Keywood Entrepreneurship Awards, we're recognizing two new companies that have come out of our students and our efforts here at this university. Red Thread, as you see here on this slide, and Bug Eater Foods, I know it sounds great. Bug Eater Foods, a developing and successful venture that started at our food processing center here at the University of Nebraska. Our research program, that second mission in our tripartite mission, hitting on all cylinders where this past year we neared the $300 million research expenditure mark for the first time in our history, almost double what it was 10 years ago with activities that result in things like our faculty, five members of our faculty being named prestigious fellows of the American Association for the Advancement of Science this past year. One of our alums, Rebecca Richards Cordum, of our College of Arts and Sciences, being recognized as one of the 25 MacArthur Fellows this year, now a faculty member at Rice University. Or the Milken Institute, recognizing that we are ranked 35th in combination with UNMC, out of 225 institutions nationally in our commercial tech transfer operations in bringing research to life, if you will, in the field. Our faculty continue to publish at a very high rate in the most prestigious journals in their fields, as well as get recognized nationally and internationally with awards. I would just point to two of our faculty, Professor Varon in computer science and engineering in the top 1% of citations in his field. Or Professor Fred Luthans, an emeritus professor in our Department of Management, in the top 1% in the web of science in all citations across all fields. That's indicative of our faculty and indicative of the quality of the work that is occurring here. We had some $248 million in sponsored grants and contracts come into the university this year. That's a 27% increase over the last five-year period in the generation of external support for our work. And while I can't highlight all of them, I want to just point to what a few of those are. 
A $20 million EPSCOR grant in the Root Rhizobiome, led by Ed Cahoon and Jim uh, Alfano. An $11.3 million cellular signaling and biomolecular communication EPSCOR grant from NSF, led by Jim Takich and Conchetta DeRusso. A Department of Transportation grant for the Mid-America Transportation Center, led by Larry Rylett in the College of Engineering, of $13.75 million. Our Ch Center for Children, Families, and the Law, led by Michelle Graff's team, receiving a $15 million Department of Health and Human Services grant and Child Welfare Workforce Assessment Research. Or an NSF grant, recently awarded to Harkam Walia in crop stress resistance work in our Greenhouse Innovation Center and Automated Plant Phenotyping Facility of nearly $6 million. Or research from the department, or for, again from NSF, National Science Foundation, led by Ed Cahoon, and Tom Clemente in enhancement of sorghum for biofuel development. And lastly, a new graduate program being funded by funds from NSF, led by Craig Allen, director of the Fish and Wildlife Cooperative Research Unit in our School of Natural Resources, looking at vulnerable landscapes in ag-intensive environments like Nebraska. There are so many more of these grants and contracts that we could recognize for our faculty during this period of time in our history, and we congratulate all of them. I was very pleased last September to announce the formation of the new Nebraska Food for Health Center, led by Professor Andy Benson in food science and technology, bringing together faculty from six different departments across our university in concert with collaboration at UNO and collaboration at UNMC funded by a $5 million gift from Jeff and Tricia Rakes' foundation in concert with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, coupled with $35 million in investment of the university and additional philanthropy over the next five years. For the first time, bringing work together in the microbiome that will hook agricultural research with food science research, with biomedical research, to develop foods that prevent disease. Now, I want to close this kind of review of the year by talking about that third area of our mission, engagement with our state and our place. You know, we tend to think of that engagement being extension, and I'm going to speak to extension here in a moment, but it's much, much broader than that. First and foremost, we contribute directly $2 billion a year back into the Nebraska economy. That's a pretty significant engagement, I think you would all agree. And on top of that, we have this entity called Nebraska Extension that is listed and ranked as one of the top in the United States Extension programs in adult and youth education across a variety of areas, not all agriculture, community development, human sciences, quality of life in communities, the nationally leading 4-H program amongst the very leaders in the nation in that arena, and an engagement, if you will, with all of the 93 local counties in our great state, across the state. And then I would also draw your attention to, I just sat down about a week ago, when I finally got around to writing this speech. <laughs> um, I, I sat down a week ago and I just started writing out entities at the University of Nebraska that engage our state. And I got to 30 before I even stopped thinking. And I could list all of those off here for you across our campus. I'll just highlight a few. Nebraska Educational Television, Nebraska Public Policy Center, the Nebraska Center for Child, Children, Youth, Families, and Schools, as you see in this picture, the Lead Center for the Performing Arts, the Sheldon Museum of Art, the Nebraska State Museum that is so important to us, the Nebraska Press, the Bureau of Business Research, the Clifton Strengths Institute. I could go on and on, the Barclay Center. There are so many different ways that our university engages our state. The makerspace at Nebraska Innovation Campus. Over 30 now public-private partnerships that exist in that first phase of development of that public-private campus for us. Certainly in the ag arena, a whole list 
of it, things that are involved. The, tra the tractor test lab that's our most famous, maybe. The Nebraska uh, uh, State Climate Office. The National Drought Mitigation Center. I could list off a whole host in that arena as well. It's just a way of saying to all of us to celebrate the fact of how connected we are to this state and to celebrate the way that engagement happens that we can only continue to value and to grow. Now, before I move to some leadership changes, I just want to pause here for a minute because we're going to talk about a lot of people here in the next few minutes. And I want to just say thank you to each and every one of our faculty and staff. We're going to talk about service awardees. We're going to talk about some leadership transitions of the university. But all of our community here makes this happen every day and that commitment to that mission. And I just want to ask you to join me in giving a round of applause for this past year that's been phenomenal for our campus to all of our faculty, staff, and students. Please join me in a round of applause. Now, as a segue before we talk about the year ahead, I want to just point to you a little bit of the leadership transition that has occurred at your university this past year. You'll remember we talked about that last year, about the fact that we had a lot of leadership transition ahead of us on the campus. And I'm very pleased with the level of progress we've been able to make in a very short period of time. Certainly first anchored by two new amazing academic leaders to lead our academic enterprise. Dondi Plowman, as you know, joined us as the new, newly uh, defined Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Academic Officer of our campus starting on January 1, following a, a huge set of accomplishments in her role as Dean of the College of Business. Dondi has come to that role, which is a reorganization role in, in some respects, where the Division of Student Affairs now reports to that position. The Office of Research and Economic Development now reports to that position and has made very rapid progress in developing that role into more of a contemporary provost type role like our Big Ten peers. She quickly has assembled her leadership team of a high energy and quality group of people, some who were there before and changed some slightly changed roles, others who have joined that team now in these last eight months, including Amy Goodburn, now a senior associate vice chancellor and dean of undergraduate studies, Judy Walker, Associate Vice Chancellor for Faculty Affairs, now permanently appointed in that position. Sonia Feigenbaum, who you met last year for the first time. She was brand new at that time as our new Associate Vice Chancellor uh, for International Engagement and Global Strategies and also serving as our Senior International Officer for the university. James Volkmer, recent appointment as Assistant Vice Chancellor in Budget Planning and Analytics for the EVC office, Amber Williams, one of the people largely responsible for some of the data I showed you earlier today on enrollment, now our Assistant Vice Chancellor and Director of Academic Services and Enrollment Management, and Renee Batman continues in her role as Assistant Vice Chancellor and Chief Administrative Officer for the EVC office. We also were very pleased at the same time to attract our new Harlan Vice Chancellor of the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources and Vice President of Ag and Natural Resources for the system, Dr. Mike Bain. Mike joined us from the Ohio State University, where he previously served as Vice Provost for the campus there, background in plant pathology. He now tells me, he's been updating this about every three days, he now tells me he has visited 76 of the counties in our statewide campus in his first uh, series of months with us, joining a dynamic leadership team, I can tell you that from experience, in the Institute to lead that critically important part of our university forward into the future. Steve Goddard deserves a huge amount of appreciation from us for seamlessly stepping in and leading the Office of Research and Economic Development following our loss of Prem Paul last year. And I'm very pleased to announce to you today that there is a national search already underway to find the next permanent VC Red for that position, led by the search committee chaired by Professors David Selmeyer and Deb Hammernick, with the intent that we will bring that new person into our team around the first of the calendar year. So we look forward to that. 
we will have a little different structure associated with that position in that the research remit of the position will report to Dr. Plowman. The economic development remit of the position will report to me in the chancellor's role. You're all aware that we had a huge loss this summer with the loss of our friend and colleague, Dr. Juan Franco. It was a shock to all of us when he passed away uh, just briefly ago in July of this year. You know that he was underway in transition back to the faculty in his home college of the College of Education and Human Sciences at the time of his death. Uh, so I ask you to keep Elisa, his widow, and his family in your highest thoughts. They're actually on campus this week. We're hosting a celebration of Dr. Franco's life on Thursday afternoon linked to homecoming week that he was so critically a part of. And we'd ask you to join us, if you would, at 3.30 on Thursday in the Wick Alumni Center to celebrate his life. Lori Bellows so ably stepped in July 1st as the interim Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs to lead some reorganization of that division, focused very heavily this year in a revision and a renovation of the Student uh, uh, Conduct Code and Judicial Affairs, assisted by Professor John Lenich of the College of Law, and a new program that you may have seen a little bit about in the press recently related to Greek affairs and a revitalization of the Greek program across our campus, which by the way is, I think, a nationally leading type of approach. We've had several interim appointments in our dean ranks. As Lori moved to Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, the uh, Associate Vice Chancellor and Dean of Graduate Studies position uh, was open, we filled that with Dr. Tim Carr stepping up to leadership, former chair of the Nutrition and Health Sciences Department uh, in an interim role there. We were very pleased after a year of stellar interim performance as the interim College of, dean, College of Law Dean that Richard Moberly has now been appointed the permanent dean of our College of Law and is elevating our stature there through his leadership. Two of our long-serving deans, our longest serving, Steve Waller and Kasner, and Marjorie Kostelnik in the College of Education and Human Sciences have transitioned to new roles. Marjorie, I'll talk a little bit about later this morning. Uh, Steve is now the director of the Center for Grassland Studies in the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources. And in interim roles there, Beth Dahl once again has stepped up to be the interim leader of CEHS, and Tiffany Hing Moss is serving as the interim dean of CASNR. In both of those cases, we expect searches in 2018 to fill the permanent deanships for those two colleges. And then lastly, Kathy Farrell stepped into the interim leadership of our, as the dean of our College of Business uh, when Dondi moved in January and has done a stellar job there for us, former chair of the Department of Finance in the college. And I'm very pleased now that Dondi has a search underway to name the next permanent dean of the College of Business and a national search for that position. Now, Chris, start making your way to the stage. I want to recognize one leadership transition here amongst a large group. For those of you that have served in administrative roles where you've led a team, there are certain people on your team that you don't want to ever hear utter the words retire or leave or change positions. And for me, that person, the top of that list, is our friend Chris Jackson, who has served for the last 17 years as our Vice Chancellor of Business and Finance for this university. We toyed today with whether to get her a rose for every year of her 17 years of service, which is what we chose to do, Chris, or whether to get her a rose for every million dollars she's cut from the university budget. <laughs> but we didn't think that we'd be able to get her, able to carry them all out. But I know you know and appreciate the job that this lady has done for our university over the last 17 years. She's retiring at the end of this year. Please give her a round of applause.
And as you know, we, our tradition here has been that we recognize service awardees for five-year increments of service. So as you were coming into the auditorium today, you saw names scroll across the screen for our 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and 40 year service awardees that we have now instituted out in units the recognition of those employees in a more intimate environment. Like we did last year, we want to recognize a small group of our longest serving leaders of our campus. So I would welcome Professor Rick Alloway to the stage to recognize our 45 and 50 year service awardees. Thank you, Chancellor. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning to announce our service award recipients at these levels of service, beginning with our 45-year service awards. First, Hollis Anderson, presently with Procurement Services, and has also served in scientific stores. Next this morning, Flora Espinoza, who's in housing with Cather Pound Food Service. Hi, Laura. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Appreciate everything you've done. Michael Farrell, presently in Ag Leadership Education and Communication, who's also served in television, English, and journalism. Joseph Kitzmiller, also with University Television. Dr. William Seiler, presently in Communication Studies, has also served in the Division of Continuing Studies. Dr. David Selmeyer with the Nebraska Center for Materials and Nanoscience in Physics and Astronomy. Those 45-year recipients not able to attend today's event include Ellen Heil with the West Central Research and Extension Center, Catherine Clunt with the Eastern Nebraska Research and Extension Center, Brant Sampson of Biological Systems Engineering, and Daniel M. Schaff of West Central Research and Extension Center. Please congratulate all of our 45-year recipients. We now honor our longest serving employees, celebrating 50 years of service to the university. Able to be with us today include Dr. Larry J. Walklin. Dr. Walklin was hired in September of 1967, recently announced his retirement from the College of Journalism and Mass Communications in Broadcasting. Our 50-year recipients unable to be with us today include Craig J. Eckert, who retired in May of this year and served in chemistry, physics, and astronomy, and F. Gregory Hayden in the Department of Economics. Let's give a round of applause to all of our service award recipients. Thank you very much, Rick. Now, I've got a little bit of remaining time with you, and we're going to try to get out right at the top of the hour. I want to use the remaining time with you to talk about this year that we have ahead, both some of the challenges and opportunities that we have and some of the bold transformations that we're going to need to undertake for our campus as we move forward. And we talked about we're approaching 150. So in February of 2019, we'll celebrate that milepost. But I will tell you that certainly there are some challenges that we need to address that lie ahead of us in reaching that milestone. I want to talk a little bit about just the external environment here for a moment. You know, we happen to exist in very transformational times. Some might call them turbulent times globally, and what we have that happens around us on a daily basis. We certainly are aware that state and federal resources, even in the out years ahead of us, don't look like they're increasing, but are in the opposite direction. We certainly know that our funding portfolio in higher education continues to change and evolve 
somewhat from that change in state and federal levels of support that are out there for us. We also are aware that the political environment is one that is quite divisive and is supercharged, as I would call it, at the, president, at the present time. <laughs> no pun intended there. None. That's like when Ellen, that's like when Ellen Weisinger was at graduation and she said something about funeral, those of you that were there, that particular <laughs> service. No. You know, we have, we have a turbulent external environment. I would also point to you that there is a national trend that we're experiencing here at our university of concern about mental health and wellness of our students. And that those students, same students, are concerned about cost. They're concerned about their economic well-being in the future. They're concerned about the amount of debt that they will leave their education with in the future. I'll also tell you that there's concern about our leadership role in the U.S., especially in the world of science and technology. I just returned from a meeting in Europe where I was continually questioned about whether we were going to assume a leadership role in science in our country in the future. All of these are externalities that give us pause to think and give us pause to think about our values and our mission and think about the way that we deliver that mission every day to our student body and our broad clientele. Now, I will tell you that I think some of those that we'll discuss in more detail this morning require us to think somewhat boldly, especially on the fiscal side that we have immediately ahead of us. You're all aware, painfully aware, I suppose, of the fact that our state fiscal situation is much different than it was a year ago, much worse than we anticipated it would be a year ago. State tax receipts and revenues are down from the economy's situation as well as some tax reform in the state, resulting in a very difficult process for our state legislature this past year as they struggled with how to balance the budget for our state and its fiscal resources over the current biennium that we started July 1st. And as you know, coming out of that budget setting session, our state legislature ended up reducing the state appropriation of the University of Nebraska by roughly $12 million over the biennium. Now, in and of itself, that doesn't sound too bad. But when you consider the fact that no new salary dollars or benefits dollars or additional cost dollars are available in that sense, that number quickly for the university system ends up to be the $49 million figure across our campuses that you've heard President Bounds talk about these last few months. And as our Board of Regents, following the state budget being set, went into their deliberations about how to set the budget for the University of Nebraska system, they balanced that somewhat by increasing tuition this year and our current year by 5.4% across the board with an initial parameter set of 3.2% additional increase in tuition next year, starting on July 1st. And when you consider the salary and benefits piece that I talked about earlier, and that 1.75% level that we funded this year in our salary exercise, and some additional costs we know that we have, the net result to us here on the flagship campus is a budget deficit that we're facing in this two-year period totaling $17 million. That's after our enrollment and after the tuition increase, resulting in $6 million deficit for us in the current fiscal year that started July 1st and an additional $11 million deficit that we'll need to fill in the next fiscal year of the biennium starting next July. Now, I met with the administrative leadership of our campus on September the 6th and talked them through the basic budget framework that we're facing here and kind of the approach that we plan to take over the next several months to address this budget arena. A big piece of that, as you have heard discussed in the press, 
is a different approach than we've had before for the university, where starting actually two years ago, we started talking at the central administration level of the university about ways that we might be able to transform business operations and services across the university system in ways that we might be able to devote more dollars back to the academic enterprise. And you might remember that coming out of some of those early discussions was an effort and initiative we called One IT, that our own CIO and Vice Chancellor Mark Askren has been asked to lead in a dual role with the university system as Vice President and Chief Information Officer for the university system that started this past, a year ago, this past July. This effort was one that President Bounds then uh, went to, if you will, to help us think about this budget shortfall that we have ahead of us now. And in January, he commissioned 10 teams, uh, commonly referred to in our vernacular as budget response teams, looking at various areas of business operations and services across our campuses in ways that we might be able to gain budget efficiencies in those areas. And as you'll see on this slide, there are 10 of them, spanning everything from human resources, led by Bruce Curran, who you saw on stage just a moment ago, from our HR unit, to facilities management and planning, to communication marketing and PR, to procurement, to printing and copying. You see the list here in front of you, spanning the, the majority, if you will, of business service operations across the campuses. Those teams were asked to identify with some targets given to them, efficiencies that we might be able to gain from everything from consolidation and streamlining and different policies related to some things across our system to see if we could recoup some of these dollars through that process. They worked through January, February, March, reported to a steering committee that was assigned to review the recommendations that they brought forward. That steering committee then recommended to the President's Council, which is the Chancellor's and President Bounds, a set of recommendations to consider out of this process moving forward over the next several years. We accepted and recommended 72 of those to move forward in this process. Sounds like a large number over those 10 different areas of business services that are there. And out of those 72 recommendations, there was something just over $30 million in expected efficiencies to be gained from that process in the system with $22 million identified that we believe can be achieved by the end of this biennium that we can implement to have in place by June 30th of 2019. Marjorie Kostelnik, who I mentioned earlier, our longtime Dean of the College of Education and Human Sciences, was asked by President Bounds to become a senior associate on his staff starting July 1st to help lead this effort around budget efficiencies moving forward through the biennial period. And I'm very pleased that Marjorie stepped up to that leadership role to help us through the next two years. Our allocation of that, so now the flagship campus again, out of that 22 million, we have roughly $11 million, just slightly over, to recoup out of that budget efficiency process. Now here's what's different about that. I said this is different than what we've done before. Before, if we had a budget deficit, we knew what our budget deficit was and our campus dealt with it. This is different in that these dollars have been taken now out of the equation at the central administration level. So these are now moving into implementation level. Uh, you heard some of that in early August with the first appointment of Bruce Curran and Maggie Witt and Mark Miller in areas of human resources and procurement and facilities management and planning to lead that at the central level while continuing to lead our effort here on the flagship campus in all three of those areas as well. Last week, there was a release of a website from central administration talking more generally about what some of these recommendations are. What I commit to you and our leadership commits to you is that as we move through this process, we will communicate transparently with you about how this change will happen and what it will mean for all of us across the campus. 
But I want to make sure you understand that it's transformation that we see good light of on the other end of the tunnel, but we fully recognize that the next two years are going to be challenging as we work our way through that process to get to the other side of this new kind of model of shared services across the system. Remembering back to that $17 million deficit that I started with for our campus, that leaves about $6 million over the course of the biennium that we still have to address through our normal programmatic kind of process that I instituted beginning on the 6th with our academic planning committee. I will be visiting with them at some length in greater detail tomorrow to walk them through this budget framework as we begin that process with the ultimate goal that we identify by the beginning of spring semester kind of time frame, a total of $8.5 million in programmatic reductions to give us some level of strategic investment capacity. So that additional $2.5 million is roughly 1% of our state appropriated budget of $254 million. So I want to in advance just say right out front, I saw him come in earlier, I saw him in the audience, Ken Bloom, our professor of physics, who is the current chair of the academic planning committee, his team of faculty and students who serve on that committee. They have a huge amount of work ahead of them in working with us to identify how to move forward in this process, and I just want to thank them for representing you in that process here moving forward. Now let's talk about a few initiatives that I'm very excited about. One is that fiscal management, innovation of fiscal management area that I mentioned at the beginning of our talk today. And you'll remember us talking about what's the budget model for our university? And should we be thinking about revising and thinking differently perhaps of the way that that fiscal allocation happens? We mentioned that in our talk last year. We had a third task force that worked last fall in addition to the student success area and the student enrollment area on budget model, where they analyzed and looked at differing budget models across higher education, including our peers and our cohort group, both in the Big Ten and regionally. And they came back and recommended, Chris Jackson and Dondi Plowman led that group, came back and recommended that we consider moving toward what I'll call a hybrid responsibility-centered management or revenue-based management kind of model. And so Chris, in her final months with us, is working and leading a group in modeling that across various scenarios in our campus to help us as we think forward with the budget setting process in the future. I also will be soon announcing a new task force, faculty-led, that I'm going to ask to look at our academic organizational effectiveness in one particular area. This is an area that's been studied on our campus for a long time, over the last decade and a half. It's an area of huge investment of our campus, the area of the life sciences. And I'll be asking this group to look very hard at whether we are strategically positioned in all the ways that we could be in the life sciences around the way that we're organiza organizationally uh, structured. Vice Chancellors Plowman and Bain will add ex officio help to that group as we look at those areas over the course of the next several months. I also am very excited that, they, that we have a number of initiatives in the student enrollment and success area that we'll be rolling out in the coming year, that we've been studying for some time. A, a re revamp and re refresh, if you will, of our scholarships and financial aid and remissions policies, helped significantly by the new $5 million fund from athletics to fund the Husker Scholars Scholarship Program. Considering ways for us to grow and revamp and build our honors program into a thematically based type honors program in the future and growing it significantly. Consideration of expansion of the Rake School that the Rake School is currently engaged in in moving forward for that elite program on our campus. I'm very pleased that Rona Halualani 
of Hululani and Associates has now provided her report, 18 months in the works for us, around a mapping of diversity and inclusion for our campus. She reported out her results to the senior leadership of the campus in late August, then to the deans here recently in the academic leadership, and today the website goes live with that report for the entire campus here at diversity.unl.edu. The Diversity Council that has worked with us through the process uh, was able to respond and give us feedback on the report immediately. And in a nutshell, I will just tell you what it says. It says we do a lot, it's not well coordinated, it's not strategic, there needs to be a strategic plan around this area for our campus, and there needs to be very visible senior leadership on our campus for an Office of Diversity and Inclusion Excellence. And we have decided to move forward with that and to move forward to build that office and to seek that leadership for our campus in the immediate future lying ahead. Rona will be here on the 25th next week in forums for our campus to discuss her findings and her group's findings in this area for us, and I would encourage you to participate in that process. And then lastly, we have this 150th anniversary coming up, and it only happens one in 150 years. <laughs> so we want to figure out how to celebrate that year coming up, beginning the sort of next academic year. And I'm so pleased that Associate Vice Chancellor of ORED Mike Zeleny and Emeritus Professor and former Director of our Communications and Marketing, Meg Lowerman, have agreed to step up and co-lead this committee to plan that year for us ahead. They'll be appointing a steering committee and a faculty advisory and staff committee and a student committee and an external alumni committee to participate in that with us as we celebrate our 150th in even a grander style than our state has done well this past year. So we look forward to that. Now I want to close just by focusing us back really quickly. I told you early in the roadmap that I was going to come back and reaffirm mission. And I said in that introductory set of remarks that there's never been a more important time for that mission for us as the People's University. And I believe that with every ounce of my being. I believe that higher education has never been more needed. And I believe that the research that we do has never been more critical to our future. And I believe that the connection to our state has never been more important. And it's never been more important for us, even when we disagree, to have civil discourse and respect and dignity for all involved in our campus. And I prevail on you and ask you as a community to assure that we do that every day and that we deliver on our mission, upholding academic freedom, upholding freedom of speech, and doing it in a way that we're proud of here at the University of Nebraska in delivering on our mission. You know, I kind of grew up on this song called Dear Old Nebraska You from the day I met my wife. And there's a little line in the ditty, you know it, there is no place like Nebraska, yada yada, I'm not gonna sing for you, trust me. <laughs> but there's a little line in there that says, we'll all stick together through all kinds of weather. And not to be too hokey about it, but that line's important to us today as we forge forward to keep the momentum that this university has and to be where we want to be in 2025 and fulfilling that mission as we enter our next 150 years. This is the mission that we have. This is the picture from Pinnacle Bank Arena last May, just a few months ago, in that record-setting graduation that we had where we turned these young people into the world and onto their next path from the quality of education that they received here from our faculty. That's our mission. That's who we are at Nebraska. And I'll just close with the same closing that I used at the investiture in April. This is a quote that you may not, you may not pay as much attention to it as you walk by it, but it's on our beloved Memorial Stadium. And it's attributed to one of the most famous Nebraskans of all time, William Jennings Bryan. 
And it says that destiny is not a matter of chance. It's a matter of choice. We have important choices to make in the next year. I'm counting on all of you to help us to do that. I'm counting on all of you to have a remarkable year ahead of you in your own programs, in your own fields. And I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to serve as your chancellor. Go Big Red.